Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm Richard Homan. I'm the uh, president, provost, and dean here at EVMS. And this is a very special day, externally special day, to welcome back an alumnus of EVMS and our governor. Um, I have to say, governor, that uh, you know, over the course of my 30 years in academic medicine, I don't think I've seen so many students in a lecture hall in one place <laughs> at 8 a.m. in my entire career. Okay. Usually when I gave lectures at 8 a.m. and faculty do, it looks like C-SPAN at midnight. <laughs> and uh, certainly there's an overflow room as well, and we're so pleased that you're here. So I want to welcome everyone here, esteemed guests, Jim Dolling, CHKD CEO, our, our colleagues from Centera, faculty members, leaders from the community, faculty, staff, and especially the students and residents that are here as well. So I, I'm going to make a few comments and then introduce the governor and present him a little memento and then turn the whole program over to him. But as you know, Dr. Northam, Governor Northam, knows medicine. He knows the delivery system. He knows the challenges of delivering care. And he knows the thrills of curing patients and of taking care of patients over his career. But he also knows how difficult it is to navigate mental health and behavioral health services. We've made a lot of progress over the years in treating medical and surgical conditions, new technologies, new opportunities with medications, heart failure, asthma, diabetes. And everyone knows when they have those diseases where to enter the healthcare uh, field. They go to the emergency room, they see their primary care physician. In behavioral health, mental health, and the addictive disorders, people are quirks in the ocean often. They don't know how to enter care. Their families are lost. They can be hopeless, helpless, not knowing how to take care of their loved one. And today, we shine the light on mental health services through the governor's leadership to provide an opportunity for us to learn more how this state can make a difference in those vulnerable lives. So we still need to do a lot more in mental health. We've made some progress in depression and anxiety. Social stigmas have been erased. I've gone to cocktail parties and people brag about, you know, which antidepressant they're on. Uh, Fifty years ago, it was considered a weakness to have depression. Well, one of the areas of behavioral health that still is, is covered in the shadows of stigma is addiction and opioid addiction. And today we shine a light on that to let people know that it is an illness. People are suffering. Their families are suffering. And we need to make every effort we can to improve the health of this community, all of Virginians and around the country. And today we have a special guest as well who will give a talk on his journey and his challenges, overcoming the enormous challenges that he had with addiction and how he was able to overcome those and triumph in remission. It'll be a heartfelt story, emotional, I'm sure, and I'm looking forward to hearing that. Now, unfortunately, not everyone has the same outcome. All too many people are lost to opioid addiction and chemical dependency. We lose more people now to chemical dependency and overdose than we do to motor vehicle accidents. Think about that. That is a public health crisis, and our governor is addressing that. I can vividly recall one story of an individual who was a teenager, struggled with alcohol, marijuana, eventually opioids, became addicted, and despite the best efforts of his parents and his best efforts to be able to gain extended remission, he struggled. He developed a remission, was able to go to college, did superbly academically, but then one day, he relapsed, was driving this car, turned a corner, and hit an oak tree around a corner, sustaining massive life-threatening injuries. Subdural hematoma, neck fracture, a bolus aorta, a bolus mesentery. And he struggled for two years thereafter, finding ways to be able to cope with his physical rehabilitation, his addiction, and chronic pain. His name was Andrew, and he died 11 years ago, and he's our son, he was our son. And I say that only to say to you that addiction has no boundaries. It affects everyone, every demographic. 
Every individual in this room in some way probably has been touched by this disease. And yet it remains in the shadows, a lot of shame and guilt and inability to enter the healthcare track to, to seek care. And that's why we're here today, is to provide opportunities for people and our students to learn of this. So my charge to the students and residents now is to become skilled in identifying patients with addiction, and opioid, specifically opioid uh, addiction, to be able to be knowledgeable, to provide care, to eliminate the social stigma through your compassion, your leadership, and your community service, because I'm confident that your generation can address this more effectively than mine. So please, consider that when you leave the room today and in your future practice. So I want to thank uh, Governor Northam for his enormous leadership. And I'd like to go ahead and give him a short introduction and then present him with a special little memento that we do for special speakers. As you know, he's a native Virginian and was raised in the Eastern Shore. And there's something about genes that get passed on from parents to children because his father was a circuit court judge and taught him about politics. And his mother was a nurse who taught him about healthcare. And guess what? He became a clinician and a politician and a community leader. In that tradition, he attended VMI, was the honor court president, and graduated with a degree in biology. And then 37 years ago, he was in this room, in one of these chairs. Mm -hmm. I think he was a back row kind of guy like me, <laughs> but I'm not sure. And he launched his medical career. So in 1984, he graduated from EVMS and then completed his residency at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio. It's where he met his wife, Pam, who's a pediatric occupational therapist, and then went on to his fellowship at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in child neurology. He eventually served as the chief resident at Johns Hopkins Hospital in both pediatrics and neuro neurosurgery. After his training, he served our country, so he's a hero as well, and went to Germany and took care of wounded uh, uh, military individuals who were wounded on the battlefield during Operation Desert Storm. He then returned to Hampton Roads, practiced at CHKD, helped to establish the Children's Specialty Group, and he demonstrated his community service by being the medical director of Edmark, the children's hospice in this region where he took care of terminally ill children. That speaks to his heart and his character. And then as a state senator, he helped to change the laws in Virginia to eliminate smoking in bars and restaurants as a public health menace. And then as governor, in a short six months, he expanded Medicaid to provide opportunities for care for 400,000 Virginians. Please thank him for all of that work. So it's no surprise that he tackles difficult issues, and that's why he's here today for this very difficult issue. And he's shining a light on this to be able to provide ways to improve the health of Virginians. He will save more lives through his work as governor than he will have ever touched in his clinical practice. He's done so with humility, grace, dedication, and aplomb. He's a superb clinician, leader, and as I say, even more importantly, he's a wonderful human being. So let me have doc Dr. Northam, our governor, join me when I present him a small token of our appreciation. The, the cup that I gave him is a Jefferson cup that we give to all of our esteemed lecturers here at EVMS. It's a tradition since 1976. And Mr. Jefferson, whom I think you know the history of, designed it, it's engraved, and it's a small token of our deep appreciation for what you've done for EVMS, Hampton Roads, Virginia, and the healthcare delivery system regionally, nationally as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Holman. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. As we say, bright and early here in, in Norfolk, it is just such a a privilege and, and pl pleasure to be back uh, where it all started for me, uh, President Homan, and thank you so much 
for your kind introduction, uh, and thank you for sharing your story. Uh, and I think a point that, uh, if you listen, uh, these individuals that are addicted and, and often die from opioids are, are people just like you and me, and you will learn that this morning, and uh, we need to get past that stigma and, and treat it like the disease that it is and make sure that we get these folks help. I, I was uh, interested when I, when I heard uh, President Holman say that the students are in here this morning and you've never seen this many students uh, at, at eight, eight o'clock in the morning. And you know, I went to VMI and, and classroom attendance was mandatory. And, <laughs> and so if you didn't show up and if you didn't show up on time, uh, you received demerits and then penalty tours and uh, couldn't leave post, et cetera. And, and so anyway, I, I started here at EVMS and it's like the, the natural thing for me was that you show up for class. And, and I was here one morning, I was tired and, and didn't feel well. And, and I said to myself, you know what? I don't even need to be in here this morning. So, uh, but, I, but I always encourage uh, the students, you learn so much uh, listening to your uh, attendants and your, your uh, professors. So it's always good to attend class. And, and being on the other side now and doing some teaching, uh, a lot of effort goes into uh, preparing for a lecture. So I, I, I appreciate and encourage you all to, to really attend. It's great to see my folks from child neurology. I, I miss all of you and uh, right here on the front row. So uh, uh, again, thank you all uh, for being here. I, you know, as, as uh, President Holman said, I, I graduated from here in, in 1984. This is where I got my start uh, in, in the medical profession. Uh, left and served in the Army for eight years. And then Pam and I came back to, to Norfolk in uh, 1992, uh, started our practice, children's specialty group, uh, just had a, a great career here. And it's interesting, uh, and I say this to the students and residents, it's interesting how your life sometimes can take a different twist and turns. And if you had asked me when I was sitting in that chair like you are, if I would ever get into politics or even think about being governor of the Commonwealth, I'd, I'd said you, you've uh, gotten into the juice. Uh, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I was sitting uh, with our, uh, one of our professors uh, talking about uh, our research one morning, and he said, how's it going, Ralph? This was back in kind of 06, 07. I said, I'm frustrated. I've, you know, we, um, I'm spending more time on the phone uh, getting authorizations from insurance companies than I am you know, seeing my patients and uh, just frustrated. And he said, well, why don't you do something about it? And you, know, you never turn down a, a challenge. And so uh, I went home. And, and for those of you that, that may be interested in going into politics, the first thing that I would recommend is to discuss this with your spouse uh, <laughs> before you launch in. But I, I said, Pam, I, I think I'm going to run for the Senate. And I, I did uh, in 07, not really having a lot of experience in, in politics. And we were successful uh, in that campaign. I ran again in 11 for reelection, and then in 13 ran for lieutenant governor. And then last year, I ran for governor. And I would just say that it's been a tremendous privilege, and I, I look forward to my next three and a half years. And, and so some of the things uh, President Holman said that we've been able to work on, thus bringing practice to policy, the, the first thing was the, the banning of smoking in our restaurants, which uh, I don't know about you, but I don't like uh, being exposed to secondhand smoke. And so that's something that we work on. We, we passed that piece of legislation back in 09, uh, then did a lot of work with autism, making sure that our children had access to uh, evaluations and diagnosis, and then they were able to receive treatment. Uh, so I worked on that project. And then something that was near and dear to us as child neurologists was the work we did with concussions, making sure that our student athletes are, are safe. And then this last year, really, with your help, and I thank you all for uh, this was a team effort, but to be able to expand health care to up to 400,000 working Virginians is, uh, is, I think, something we can all be proud of here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so now as governor, uh, my partners, uh, who I think they're still my partners, uh, <laughs> said, you know, Ralph, it'd be good if you came back and saw some patients every now and then. And so I had uh, scheduled to maybe come back to, to Norfolk uh, at least once a month or every other month. And, and then once the lawyers uh, in the Commonwealth heard about it, so they said, no, Dr. Northam, I don't think that's a, a real good idea. <laughs> and so while I can't see 
patience, I can still teach. And so that's what I have chosen to do, to, uh, to go around the Commonwealth and, and really reach out to, to students and residents and, and even providers out in the field and talk about uh, different ways to, to treat both acute and chronic pain. So, so this is my mission uh, now, and I, I think you'll, you'll see that when you hear Ryan's story, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge that we all need to wrap our, our arms around. So I, I appreciate you uh, indulging me uh, this morning and, and letting me do that. And I'm going to do this in uh, kind of in, in honor of what we do classically in, in child neurology. And neurology is when we have our uh, grand rounds or our neurology conference, we like to bring a patient in. Uh, we bring a patient in and, and take a history uh, and then examine the patient. I've told Ryan, I said, Ryan, you don't have to worry about getting the exam this morning, so it's all good. <laughs> but, but a point I want to make to you students and residents, it, the history is the most important part of, of seeing a patient. And we have all this technology and MRIs and lab tests, but I tell people, if you don't know what's wrong with your patient after you've taken a history, you need to keep asking questions because your patient will tell you. Uh, what's going on. So always uh, pay attention to your, to your history. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce one of my friends, Ryan Hall. Ryan, come on up to the, to the stage. Please welcome Ryan to Mark. <laughs> so Ryan is from Clifton Forge. And if you don't know where Clifton Forge is, it's out in the western part of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Virginia a beautiful area of Virginia in, in Allegheny County. Uh, and his father, Sheriff Kevin Hall, is with us this morning. And your fiance, right? And your fiance's first name is Lachelle. Lachelle. And Lachelle, thank you for, for being with us this morning. And congratulations uh, on your, your engagement. So we're just going to chat uh, with, with Ryan for a little bit and uh, hear his story. And then we, get, we have a little documentary film. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, what uh, his diagnosis uh, is and how we, we manage that here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So, Brian, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, uh, you made the long trip. Uh, the Commonwealth is a, a large area, and it's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of territory to cover. But um, you grew up in Clifton Forge? Uh, Covington. You, okay, from Covington. All right. But you live in Clifton Forge. Okay, all right. I got that straight. Tell us a little bit about what it was like for you in high school in Covington. Um, well, you know, it's a real, real small town. We think we have like 21,000 people in the entire county and about 7,000 people in the city limits. So uh, everybody knows everybody. And, uh, you know, I was involved in everything in high school, you know, as far as club-wise and sports-wise. And, uh, you know, it was kind of, you know, an upstanding member of the community. You know, my dad being the sheriff, my mom is a registered nurse. She works for the state. And uh, I just tried to stay busy, was involved. And you like to play sports? Love to play sports. Tell us a little bit about football. Well, uh, senior year of football, we had been playing, you know, around the state, and but they had seven on seven, which was, you know, uh, I played wide receiver. And, uh, you know, I've been talking to a few colleges about coming to play college football. And, um, I actually broke my hand a week before the first game of the season, which was the Allegheny and Covington game, which is uh, Virginia versus Virginia Tech. And, <laughs> and uh, I broke my hand. I had a boxer fracture in my hand because uh, we were just goofing off in practice. We mm -hmm. And uh, I told them, you know, they said you're out for four weeks with a boxer fracture. You can't play the Allegheny Covington game. And uh, I said, you know, I'm playing the Allegheny Covington game. It's the last game I get to get to play those guys. We're going to beat them this year. They had beat us like 15 years in a row. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to beat them this year. So I stayed up for practice, wore my cast down so I could catch and uh, played in the game. And then I was going to sit out the next couple weeks and then let it heal. I just wanted to play that one game because it was a rivalry game. And uh, on the third play of that game, I had a tibia plateau fracture, dislocated kneecap, torn MCL, ACL, and meniscus. And the tibia had to be uh, screwed back together. And you wound up in the hospital? 
Yes, sir. Tell us about your discomfort and how they treated that. Well, uh, well I got there on a Friday night, and uh, I was first given uh, morphine in the, uh, in the ambulance, and then whenever I got to the hospital, they started me on the liquid allotted drip, and uh, I could get that every four hours. And uh, they didn't want to do surgery because they said there was a whole lot of bleeding in the leg and they wanted to wait, so I had to wait from Friday to Tuesday, and I was also a little dehydrated, so my leg would cramp, and uh, it was, you know, when, when your leg cramps up, it gets real tight, and then I had a broken bone and all these ligaments in there, and uh, it was, you know, it was hurting real bad, and uh, so I stayed on the liquid a lot of drip, and uh, so I think Monday, and then they said, you know, you can't take that anymore, and they gave me Percocet. Mm -hmm. Did the did the dilaudid take take the edge off your pain? Yes, sir. And did it do anything else to you? I mean, did 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 it just get rid of the pain, or did it make you feel uh, oh, differently? I, yeah, I, I I definitely was high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> definitely. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I I remember taking it a couple times and immediately going to sleep. Mm -hmm. and, and if you can just uh, just kind of summarize, I, I know you. You recovered from that, but then you had some other injuries, and so which led to taking some narcotics along the way. Just kind of give us an outline of that. Well, like for a year, I was on and off painkillers for probably, I'd say, out of maybe 16 months, I was probably on painkillers for 14, I mean, 12 of the months, a whole year, because I had uh, my wisdom teeth cut out too. I I got dry sockets, and uh, then. Um, we had a derecho hit, and we have a 100-foot waterfall where I live, and we all go down there and swim. And uh, I jumped off mm -hmm. a rock trying to be Tarzan or something, I guess. That's and, called youth. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, broke uh, tibia, tibia fracture the same leg again. And uh, so. When did you know, when did you say to yourself, I've got a problem? Um, when I, when I started getting sick. Mm -hmm. And this is an important thing to realize or talk about, and we'll, we'll do it for just a couple minutes. Um, there's a difference between getting high and needing that next dose, and then there's, there's what we call dope sick, uh, which is, I've had people, will you just, what does it feel like when, when you're withdrawing from a narcotic? The worst, the worst case of the flu that you've ever had. Mm -hmm. Hot one second, Hot, you're sweating, but you're freezing cold. Diarrhea, vomiting. Um, How about achy, sleeping? Can't sleep. Can't get comfortable. And so this led you to need that next dose. And tell us about, I mean, how that affected your family, and what did you do to to uh, get that next dose? Uh, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Steal. Uh, wrote bad checks. Um, stole from my family. I, I was in cop. Well, I dropped out of college, and I sold all my textbooks, my laptop, uh, you know, anything that I could get my hands on that wasn't nailed down was probably going to get stolen, sold. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, I wasn't even getting high anymore. I was just careful. Did you turn to heroin? Yes, sir. Tell me about that. Well. Uh, that I remember that I, I, was, I was in college and it was my freshman year and you know, uh, I was doing the typical back row kind of guy thing uh, and uh, you know, drinking and you know, smoking marijuana and occasionally popping pills and uh, pills were you know, my preference. And the guy said, you know, uh, if, you, uh, if you like pills, you should try heroin. And uh, I ended up trying heroin, and uh, then it took off from there. And then I, the guy that I was getting the heroin from, he eventually ended up getting fentanyl mm -hmm. and uh, powder fentanyl. And uh, I ended up doing powder fentanyl, and uh, they, it, it it took a turn for the worse after that because it was more powerful and I became more addicted and needed more and more often. Mm -hmm. 
if I could, uh, if, if, if you could kind of look back through this uh, journey, if you will, what could, what could doctors, what could providers have done to, to help you through this? Um, I probably could have done without the liquid a lot. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, a little pain and discomfort is all right. Um, it, you don't you don't need to numb everything out, and uh, you know. And then another thing is, is you know, you go from ten. I was on ten milligrams of Percocet, and three times a day, so twenty milligrams. It was two each time, plus uh, tramadol, fifty mm -hmm. milligram tramadol, uh, twice a day, and for probably eight weeks. And then after the eighth week, I had nothing. So, uh, you yeah. know. And maybe it's that nothing that we need to, to hear, because when, when you've been on uh, opioids, narcotics for a, a length of time, it, to just say, uh, have a nice life, it, you really need continued follow-up, don't you? Right. Yeah, okay, all right, good. And the last question I'm gonna ask you, um, one of the things that's difficult as a provider, if I'm sitting there listening to your story or exam you, and, and I, I say to myself, I. I know, I know you have a problem. I, I know you need help. What's the best way for me to communicate that to you? Because we always, you know, we don't want to be confrontational with our patients. All right. Well, like the biggest, biggest thing with me is whenever somebody talks to you like uh, a friend or like another human being doesn't, doesn't talk down on you, uh, you know, understands what you're going through, sympathizes with what you're going through, and. Uh, you know, goes about it like that, you know, instead of saying, you know, I'm a doctor, I know you're an opioid addict, you're not getting any pills, you know, get this, that, and third, so, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, humanize with the patient, sympathize yeah. with the patient. Good point. Can you, can you play our video for us? Everywhere you turn, the headlines are not good. Images of hopelessness and pain plague our cities large and small. Even in rural places like Covington, Virginia, there's a drug epidemic that is destroying and ruining lives like a vicious computer malware that can't be eradicated. Just ask Ryan Hall about his battle with drugs. As a top-ranked high school student and athlete and the son of a well-known and highly respected sheriff, Ryan at one time had everything going for him and his dreams and future look bright. Ryan never got in trouble. He, uh, he always listened to what you told him to do. It was like he was always a leader. He was a uh, you know, class president, uh, voted youth attorney general, captains of you know, football and basketball. And always uh, real, done real well academically, just fun loving. Uh, you know, we'd joke around and, and things. Uh, Allegheny County is a really good place to raise a family uh, because it is a pretty low crime area. Uh, we do have a little small movie theater and we have a uh, sports complex. But So really, sporting events is one of the main activities to be involved in Allegheny County. I played every sport that, that was out there. I played soccer until I could play football. I played basketball, I played baseball. Anything that was going on at school, I wanted to be a part of it. Uh, as far as clubs in high school, I was uh, beta club, uh, president of student council. I was uh, in fellowship of Christian athletes, a bu bunch of different clubs in, in, in school. But all that Ryan worked and hoped for began to change the night his football career came to a sudden end. He was being looked at by a couple schools because, like I said, he was, he was very quick and he had really good hands. He could catch anything. I went in on a, what you call a crack back where the receiver pretty much blindsides the outside linebacker so people can run on the outside. 
and our quarterback started scrambling and he came out in the whole pile that was tackling him. My, my leg was caught and I couldn't move, I guess. Somebody was laying on, laying on my foot or something like that and the whole pile kind of fell into my leg and I, I knew it was broke as soon as it happened. There was people in the stands who said that they heard it pop. It broke the bone vertically that right in the kneecap. The joints were at the knee. Tibia plateau fracture. And uh, he laid in the hospital for five days before he had surgery on the lot and a lot of pain and everything. I believe it all, the addiction all started right then because I wanted the liquid Dilaudid. Every four hours that I could get it, I wanted it. And uh, so I was on the liquid Dilaudid for three days. And um, they said that uh, he can't take the liquid Dilaudid anymore because I guess they were fearing that I was, you know, becoming addicted to it or, you know, because I was pushing the button every time I could get it. Well, they gave me the Percocets and uh, that was probably the worst night that I had in the hospital. I was up um, and then they finally came back in and gave me the Dilaudid again. And uh, then I had the surgery and, you know, I went home, couldn't walk for eight weeks, couldn't go to school, had teachers come to my house. Um, and was on painkillers that, through that time. And along with uh, tramadol. And uh, the combination between those two um, just, it increases your high. You know? Over time, as Ryan's drug prescriptions came to an end, the drug dealers began to feel his darkened void. And um, the, the guy was like, you know, if you like pills, you know, you should try heroin. And, you know, I asked him, you know, of course, you know, well, what's the difference between heroin and pills? And uh, he said heroin is pills times 10. So, uh, of course, I, I like the sound of that at that point. So then, you know, with the, with the opiates and everything, it's not like cocaine, it's not like, uh, crack, meth, anything like that. You, you, you become sick when, when you don't have it. And once you get to that point, there's no turning back. And it's not, it's not, a, it's not just a let's go get high moment anymore. It's I have to get this now because I'm sick. And once, once it becomes to that, you're, you know, you're, you're willing to go to any, any length to, to get cured from the sickness and you're willing to do whatever to your family, to, to anybody. You're, you're ready to steal, you're ready to cheat, lie, you're, you're, you're ready to do whatever. Working as a narcotics officer from 96 to 98 with the state police on the drug task force, I knew a lot of people. I knew a lot about drugs. People, I've coached a lot of kids, so people tell me things. And some people had started telling me you know, that Ryan was, they thought Ryan was using heroin. So I sent uh, my task, drug task force officer along with another to go find him and talk to him. And after they talked to him is when he called me and said, hey, I need help. You know, I'm, I'm on heroin. Despite his father's help and several attempts at rehab, Ryan eventually found himself behind bars. After completing his 18-month sentence, Ryan is working to do the right things and stay straight on the path he is on. What's happened since Ryan was released is uh, you know, he's back. He's got, you know, he's trying to make up time with his little girl. He's trying to find employment. And um, with the felony records on there, uh, it's kind of hard. He's, like you say, Ryan was just you know, he had everything going for him, and then this drug got a hold of him, and it just totally changed him. This, this, this whole addiction, the, the whole thing with, with heroin, pills, drugs, period, it has gotten me felonies on my record. All, all these charges, the burglary, the, the forging and uttering with the checks, the, uh, you know, me going to jail, me not seeing my daughter, uh, me not 
graduating from college, me dropping out of college, uh, it's all because of heroin. Period. And heroin just ended all of that. And it ended all, all, all dreams, you know. And, 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 and the cycle, the cycle is you're, you're going to keep on using, and then you're going to get caught using. You're either going to, you're going to go to jail, or you're going to get caught by your family, and then you're going to go to rehab, and you're going to make them happy for 28 days, and then you're going to get out, use again until you get caught again, and then you're going to go back to rehab and make them happy for 28 days, and then try to fool them again, and you know, you just, keep on keep on and keep on it's just a cycle that you just can't break it's it's a it's a constant constant struggle you know what i mean but do i think i'll ever use heroin again no because i know but what was scaring me is i was popping pills and i know how it goes you start popping pills and then it just progresses until eventually you're using heroin again. And then the only the only way out of that is jail or dead. Now as we wrap up our series tonight on the faces of addiction, tonight we introduce you to perhaps the most unlikely sufferer that we talked to. Virginia State Police recently documented the story of the Allegheny County Sheriff and his son who got addicted to heroin. You're gonna, you're gonna see things. You're gonna be tempted. You're gonna have to make decisions. Ryan was using 10 bags of fentanyl a day, all at one time. His father says it's enough to kill most people. And how he ever was able ever to survive, I think it's just a message from God that here, there's a purpose for you out here to share your story to help save someone else. It's been a long, tough road. That's exactly what he's doing now, owning his story. The students gain wisdom from his painful past, and in return, Ryan gets to look forward to another day clean and sober. It only takes one time. And you know, if you're a heroin addict and you try heroin one time, then you're going to ruin your life. It's, it's, it's going to grab it. If you're a cocaine addict, you try cocaine one time, the same thing. Meth, the same thing. Alcohol, the same thing. You know, anything. You just don't do it. The only thing I can add is if please talk to your parents, you know, before you ever do anything uh, that you shouldn't or a police officer or, you know, if, if I or my son can ever help anybody, I think that's what we want this. To, we want this to help save somebody else, save some other family from having to go, go through this and that. Please don't underestimate the power of these drugs. It's, it's just unreal, it changes, it totally changes the person. Do not try this stuff. This stuff right here is so bad, it's so powerful that you're gonna be addicted to it and you're just gonna, you're gonna ruin, you're gonna ruin your life. I remember from the beginning, I told these guys when they went to go find my son, I said, go find him. I want to save my son's life. There's just so many people out here that are dying with a needle in their arm. And just, please don't do that. Please don't put your... <laughs> please don't put yourself or your family through that. From gambling compulsions to internet disorders, there's many forms of addictions, but none are as bad or as more deadly than drugs. It is ruining more lives than ever before, even in the most unlikely places of our nation. That's one tragic headline that doesn't have to include you. Don't let drugs ruin your dreams. Thank you all. Uh, Ryan, uh, I think it's, uh, it's commendable that you shared your story with us. And uh, I know it's been a year. You just announced, uh, uh, I guess, a couple weeks ago. It's been a year you've been clean. And uh, we just 
thank you for all you're doing and, and, and wish you the best. Let's give Ryan a hand for being with us. So let's take about 20 minutes and just try to put this in perspective. And I want to let you know some of the things that we're doing at the state level to help folks like Ryan and his families. But the first is to, to realize that this is a, a chronic and relapsing disorder. It's, you know, Ryan is continuing to fight his battle. Once, once the brain has been exposed to, to these chemicals, there are changes in the limbic system. And it's not something that will just get better overnight. So it's an ongoing process. There's definitely a genetic predisposition. Uh, we're working uh, every year toward what we call personalized health care, and it would really be nice to know uh, eventually which uh, patients out there are at risk for opioid addiction. Uh, these are some powerful numbers here. Last year, uh, just last year in Virginia, we lost 1,227 Virginians to opioid overdose. Uh, that's a lot of Virginians. As, as uh, as President Homan said, that's more than uh, we'll die on our highways. Uh, it's the first that uh, we've ever seen that kind of statistics. It's more than we'll die from gun violence. So it is a significant, significant problem. And if you look at addiction uh, as a whole, uh, 1,534 deaths in the Commonwealth last year. Um, and the point that if I can make to you this morning is that oftentimes, just as Ryan shared his story, this addiction problem starts with a prescription from someone like you or me, uh, a provider, a dentist for wisdom teeth, and we need to think twice uh, before we uh, start someone on, on opioids. And um, I have traveled around uh, to different jails and penitentiaries and talked with inmates uh, who are addicted or were addicted to heroin. And I was in Chesterfield uh, not too long ago and, uh, with about 50 uh, inmates who were all in there because of drug-related problems. And I said, how many of you all in this room started this journey with a prescription? And almost all of them raised their hands. And when I heard that, I said, we've got to do something about this. And we've got to look at other ways of, of treating both acute and, and chronic pain. And finally, it's, it's a problem that is just as common as diabetes and, and depression. And again, we need to, to realize that. And, and I think a point that has been made, but I'll make it again, these are people in our family. They're our neighbors, our friends, perhaps our, our colleagues. Uh, it, is, it does not discriminate, and these are not bad people. They're people that have, again, uh, started down a journey for one reason or another that, that we need to help. Next slide, please. I just wanted to reinforce the statistics. If you look over toward the right, there's 2015, 2016, and 2017 and a significant jump uh, between 15 and 16 uh, of about 40% increase, and then between 16 and 17, uh, just under 10%. Um, so you have to ask yourself, what's going on there? Next slide. If you look at this graph, uh, the, the black line on the top is, is opioids in general. Uh, the blue line is a prescription uh, opioids or narcotics. And then the red line is fentanyl. And as Ryan described, and, and what you've seen in the last couple of, of years uh, across the Commonwealth, not only are people uh, having access to heroin, uh, but now they're having access to heroin that's laced with fentanyl and carfentanil. Carfentanil uh, is used in veterinarian uh, hospitals, and it's about 100 times more potent than fentanyl. And, and the bottom line here is if a person like Ryan uh, is exposed to heroin with fentanyl or carfentanil, if they don't have something to reverse that, uh, like the Narcan, then they're going to be a statistics. It's, just, it's that, that simple. Did you, I'm just curious, did you ever have anything that, that had the carfentanil in it uh, or just not, the fentanyl? Not that, not that I'm, I have overdosed before. But. Mm -hmm. And this was something that someone told me one time that was kind of interesting, that if there was a death, let's say two blocks down here, uh, and the, the word on the street was that it was heroin that was laced with fentanyl, that's where people wanted to go because Absolutely. they, yeah, tell me, what, what was that like? Well, so in more like in bigger cities, drug dealers will do it purposely, they'll uh, give 
the, the uncut heroin or fentanyl out, overdose someone, but if they die, they die. If they don't, then oh well. But then those people know that that's the best drug that they can get. So ever, mm -hmm. and you're you're working with an addicted mind, so you're not thinking clearly at this point. And yeah, I've taken chances so many times. Mm -hmm. And you know, people said, "Don't do that much. Don't do that much. Don't do this. Don't do that." And I say, "You know, I'm, I know what I'm doing." Man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you take so many chances, and just luckily, you know, I've only overdosed one time. But, mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Can you go to the next slide, please? This is an interesting graph, um, and I want you to look at where these two graphs cross. This is uh, one's first exposure to a narcotic, and uh, in the past, uh, it was it was usually heroin. Uh, but if you look at this uh, bottom graph that then goes up, those are prescription drugs. And uh, I don't know if you all remember, but in 1995, the FDA approved the use of OxyContin. And OxyContin, interestingly, was marketed to providers like you and me as being, this is the way we keep our patients comfortable. And the incidence of addiction using OxyContin was less than 1%. That's what we were told. And so look at that graph uh, of you know, how, uh, how narcotic addiction went up after that was introduced. And this was a, not to throw stones this morning at pharmaceuticals, but this was Purdue Pharmaceutical, and, and they're in the middle of a, a lot of litigation uh, because of that. And, and when individuals were patients were coming back requesting more OxyContin, rather than saying, we've got a problem with addiction, the pharmaceutical company was saying, you're under treating your patients. They need more medicine. Uh, for the discomfort they're having. So uh, it really was a significant impact on, on this whole problem uh, back in the, the mid-90s mid into the early 2000s. And next slide, please. So I didn't come this morning to give you a tutorial on managing pain, but I just wanted to kind of review briefly some of the things that, that we have available and, and, and make a point or two. But the first is emojis. And you remember those, you, you walk into the room and, how are you feeling today? Um, and you, you either had the smiley face or, oh, it's, I feel terrible, doc. And, and we were trained that if they feel terrible, well, let's keep them comfortable. And so, as Ryan said, we don't want to have anybody that's uncomfortable, but pain can sometimes be helpful in helping us diagnose where the problem is, what we need to do to, to help that patient. So pain is not necessarily a, a bad thing. And so, when you think of using narcotics, always remember that you know good old Tylenol. There's nothing wrong with Tylenol, uh, NSAIDs, uh, the ibuprofen, naproxen, IV, Toradol, uh, regional nerve blocks uh, can can be beneficial. And then chronic pain, uh, and I know my neurology friends are, are well aware of all these, but uh, certainly we use tricyclic antidepressants, uh, Elevil or amitriptyline is is one of those. Uh, a number of anticonvulsants. Tegretol, Topamax, Trileptal, Neurontin, Cymbalta, which is an antidepressant, Lyrica, which is pregabalin, uh, is used. Acupuncture can be uh, beneficial for chronic pain. Botox is another agent we're using for chronic migraine that seems to uh, have some effect. But I, I guess the point that I want to make is, is the last one. And when someone comes into your office, especially recurrently with, with chronic pain, Think about the comorbid uh, conditions, whether they have depression or post-traumatic stress disorder or, or diabetes or so they've lost someone in their family. So always think about those comorbid conditions and, and make sure that part of your treatment plan is, is counseling uh, as well as medications. Next slide, please. These are some things that we're doing in, in Virginia that I will we'll go through quickly, but uh, the first is the, what we call the ARTS program. And I don't know if you all are familiar with that, but that's a program that's uh, monitored through or administered through Medicaid. Uh, it stands for Addiction and Recovery Treatment Services. And uh, the reimbursement rates have been increased for individuals that are working in this program, and, and that has helped uh, uh, with patients gaining access. So that's a, been a very successful program in, in Virginia. And, and um, people say, well, how do you get help? Where do you go? And I think Rick, uh, President Holman, made this point. The community service boards are, are very involved right now with, 
with uh, the addiction crisis. Medicaid expansion, and I, I mentioned this earlier, it just a, a large number of new revenue, new resources are now available in Virginia uh, to especially deal with, with mental health issues and the, the opioid addiction. So we, uh, we always could use more resources, but we, we're at least uh, moving in the, the right direction. A provider development and awareness, one of the reasons that I'm doing what I do is to make folks like you aware uh, of the problem. We have certified <coughs> substance abuse counselors. Uh, we also have continuing CME for especially primary care providers that are interested in, in addiction. Uh, how do you recognize addiction? How do you deal with it uh, patient to provider? And, and then where do you go for, for help? So, so that is something that has been successful. And, and just to reiterate, and, and uh, uh, Ryan and I have had this discussion, but the, the, what we call MAT, which is the medically assisted treatment, the suboxone, the, uh, the, the methadone, the, the uses of medications, and counseling, it's, a, it's really a, a combination that we're using to, to help individuals like Ryan. And, and one of the things that we've done through our CSBs, our community service boards, is to have same day access. Patients, uh, not uncommonly, would come into the ER uh, with an overdose, they'd be, be given Narcan, and then they'd be sent home. And then it would just, like, like Ryan was saying earlier, it's just a, a cycle that keeps on going. And so we really want to, to identify those patients and get them into treatment as, as quickly as we can. So now we have same-day access. Next slide, please. It's great having someone <laughs> keeping the slides going. So you're doing a great job, and we, we appreciate that. Um, some, some other things that are going on in Virginia, the opioid prescribing regulations. And this has been a bit controversial, but uh, now you can only give a prescription for seven days. Uh, there are some uh, folks that are advocating for less than seven days. We, we, if you look at the data, uh, there are individuals that are genet genetically predisposed that if they are exposed to a narcotic for three to four days, the, the rest is history. And so it would really be nice to be able to identify those individuals. But for right now, it's seven days. Drug take backs, um, the pharmacies are being very cooperative. Uh, if you have, if your patients, your families have medications that are in the, uh, the medicine cabinet or in the drawers that they're not using anymore, they really are encouraging people to bring those back to the pharmacy and, and they can be uh, disposed of. PMP reports have been very helpful. That's a prescription monitoring program. And, and this is something that was a real issue out in the southwest part of Virginia. Heroin hadn't even moved into the Southwest because there was still such an availability of prescription drugs. And what people were doing was they were doctor shopping across state lines. As you know, out in the Southwest of Virginia, there are five states. And so it was very easy for people to go to other prescribers and, and get what they needed. So we've cracked down on that with the, the PMP reports. And, and just last year, we we, uh, just last week rather, uh, we wrote out a, a plan or a program where ERs can communicate with each other right now through the uh, electronic medical records. So if someone comes into the ER at Children's Hospital, you can get the records from if they come from Roanoke or wherever. So, and we really want to expand that, not just for the emergency departments, but for uh, practitioners across Virginia, because that's been a pet peeve of mine that we can't have access to other facilities record. So we're making a lot of progress in that regard. Um, I mentioned Narcan earlier. Uh, we are really encouraging uh, our first responders uh, to have Narcan on board and to know how to use it. And we have a blanket prescription now that if you have a patient or the patient uh, knows that they have a problem or has a friend or family member, they can go into a pharmacy and request a dose of Narcan. They don't need a prescription for that. So we've done that with a, a blanket prescription. Uh, and then comprehensive harm reduction programs, things like needle exchanges where we, we can hopefully help people. Uh, and that sounds kind of backwards. Or, you know, are you encouraging, are you condoning the use of, of heroin? But uh, using, I don't know if that was an issue for you, Ryan, as far as getting clean needles to. Nah, you, I'm, I'm a type one diabetic. So, so. so you, okay, I didn't realize that. So that, you killed two birds with one stone there, <laughs> literally. So, um, the CSBs, I, I mentioned that, uh, the same day access. We're doing a lot of work with drug courts and, uh, and uh, uh, incarceration based treatment. Uh, there are, I would just tell you, there are far too many of our patients 
who are in jails right now, and that is not the place for them to get the, the treatment they need. So we're really working on that. Um, and then just as, as Ryan does, Ryan goes out and helps counsel. There's nothing better than peer-to-peer -peer counseling, uh, someone that can hear that story directly from, uh, from Ryan. Uh, and then uh, supporting the community co to combat the stigma. And, and I will make that point again that uh, we need to get past the stigma. And I hear this all the time, well, these are bad people. They're not bad people, they're people just like you and me. But just to, to summarize here, uh, addiction is a chronic relapsing disorder. I think we've made that clear. Uh, it can be prevented. It can be prevented by people like you and me. Uh, when prevention fails, uh, uh, treatment can work. It's about 55 to 60 percent effective now when you use both the MAT, the medically assisted treatment, and counseling. Uh, so there's good news for folks out there that need help. Um, and I, I do think we're making a dent in this. We've got a lot of work to do, so I appreciate your all's help in, in uh, assisting. And, and just to reiterate that there's a, a close connection between primary care and behavior health. I want to give the students and, and residents, if I can, just a, a little bit of advice. Um, one of the things that I learned from one of the men in the front row uh, when I worked with him over on Redgate Avenue was that um, he used to tell me, he said, you know, Ralph, you're, you're, you're a young buck. You, you think you know everything, and, and people come in here and, and you label them quickly with a diagnosis. And, and you know, it's one of those things, once, once we make a diagnosis, you never change your diagnosis, right? But he said, what people really come in for is they want your help. And a diagnosis is important, but how can you take the next step and, and help that individual and help their family? And, and so, Dr. Frank, I, I don't know if you remember giving me that advice, but, but that was good advice. And so what I wanted to leave you on is the, the thought of hope. And, and as uh, uh, President Holman said, I've uh, done a lot of work with end-of-life care. I was the medical director of Edmark Hospice on a volunteer basis for about 19 years, and so I, I learned a lot about hope, but I want to just tell you or leave you with uh, a story about one of my patients when I was over on Redgate uh, Avenue uh, working with Dr. Frank. It was a, a severely autistic child, uh, about two, two and a half years old, and you know, you, uh, you, once you see someone like that, you, you recognize it pretty quickly, and and so they, the parents brought this child uh, in uh, named Logan. And uh, I told the family, I said, I'm concerned your child uh, has autism. So there's some tests that we can do if you're interested. Uh, you know, the, the, in this society, we, we, uh, a lot of folks come in and they want this and that. And, and so I said, I'll be glad to do those tests and some metabolic tests and an MRI, which the MRI is always normal. Uh, uh, and uh, genetic tests, and, and anyway, so they came back after all these tests, and I said, well, the tests came back normal, and your, your child has just a really severe case of autism, and, and I said, there's not a whole lot else, not a whole lot else I can do uh, for you and your family, and that was the last time I saw Logan, and it's about 10 or 12 years later, I was out and my wife sent me out to do some grocery shopping. And um, so I was in the grocery store and trying to figure out where things were, which is uh, <laughs> the way it is. And this lady came up to me, uh, pushing her grocery cart. She said, Dr. Northam. I said, yes, ma'am. Um, she said, I don't know if you remember me, uh, but you saw our child, Logan, uh, a number of years ago, I said, yes, I do. I do remember you. And she said, and we chose never to come back to you. And, and, and I said, uh, I realize that because uh, I haven't seen you <laughs> since. And she said, let me tell you why we didn't come back. Uh, she said, you made the diagnosis. Uh, and that, that wasn't a, a question. But, but when you told us that there was nothing else that you could do for our child and our family, you took our hope away. And so whether someone is in for their initial evaluation or whether they're on their deathbed, don't ever take their hope away. There is always something you can do, whether you help them in the initial stage or whether you keep them comfortable uh, in the final minutes. But, but hope is so important to our patients 
and their families. So I, I appreciate it. It's great to be back in Norfolk uh, today. It's just a real thrill to be back in the, uh, just the, uh, the lecture hall where, where it all started for me. And I, I thank you all for uh, being part of this discussion. Brian, I thank you and your father and your fiance, and we're so excited for, for your future. But let's all work on this together and, and make sure that if we can to to do everything that we can to, to end the addiction crisis that we're uh, challenged with in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So thank you all so much and my best to all of you. Thank you very much.